making a wise choice. We continue with our studies from the book of Proverbs, looking at chapter 12 this evening. I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you look at from verse 1, it kicks off and says, Whoso loveth instruction, loveth knowledge. So again, we see instruction and knowledge going hand in hand. To reiterate, knowledge is the accumulation of facts. And instruction, we looked at chapter 8, particularly where we looked at wisdom's instructions, and there were seven that were listed. In our first Bible study, to know wisdom of chapter 1, we looked at those seven things that pertain to wisdom, and ultimately they culminate with the pinnacle being understanding. Remember, with regards to wisdom, it says in Proverbs 4 7, wisdom is the principal thing, but in all you're getting, get understanding. And we looked at in chapter 9, we, we looked at wisdom has builders her house, she has hewn out her seven pillars, the seven pillars of wisdom. When we looked at that particularly, we noticed that knowledge and wisdom and particularly understanding was mentioned four times in that specific passage. So the wise person, when we touched two studies ago, we looked at the wise and foolish contrasted. We used the story from Matthew chapter 7, 24, where the wise man built his house upon the rock. We established that the rock is Christ from 1 Corinthians 10, 4. And the foolish man built his house upon the sand. He's like the one that buries his single talent, which is taken from him at the time of judgment. So we're going to cover on those things and just to regather and to recap what we've studied in the past. But he that wait, hateth reproof is brutish. So somebody that is brutish is foolish, according to this. We know from the fool in Psalm 14, 1 and Psalm 53, 1, the fool says in his heart there is no God. So he's brutish, foolish. He's the one that's built his house upon the sand. He's a fool, whereas the wise has heard the word of God and he has done the word of God. He's heard the word of God. He's heard the instruction and he's applied it. We'll get to the word prudent later when we're in verse 16 and we know we've studied the um, definition of prudent, the biblical definition from Psalm 90 verse 12. When you apply wisdom, essentially that is being prudent. So when it says here, but he that hateth reproof, so he hated reproof. What is reproof? Well, we know from 2 Timothy chapter 3.16, it tells us there that all Scripture is inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for the instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Essentially what reproof is, when you, get some, when you give something to a printer and ask him to print it for you, he'll send you a reproof to check that what he's going to make multiple copies of is tallies and tabulates to what you have given him. So it's ultimately what reproof is, is basically checking that it's true. Checking with the template of truth. Checking with the doctrine, the teaching. Doctrine. The first two words of doctrine is do. You've got to do what you taught. The wise man heard the word of God. He did the word of God. He did. He do. Doctrine. Teaching. So, whoso loveth knowledge who, and whoso loveth instruction but the, he that hateth reproof is brutish. So the one that doesn't check is a fool. The one that at this point in time that is not reading their Bible is a fool. The one that's not studying in accordance with 2 Timothy chapter 2.15 study to show yourself a proof unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. You've got to work it. You've got to study it. The one that's not doing that is not taking God's word seriously to the point that he's brutish and he's a fool and he's not checking. We need to check ourselves against what we ought to be learning. 2 Timothy 2 7 says, Consider what I say, and the Lord gives you understanding. So we need to consider between the bounds of Romans and Philemon, that is understanding for our period of time, our dispensation. That is priority. Our doctrine is Romans, Ephesians, and Thessalonians. Thessalonians speaks about the rapture, about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ particularly. That 
in a nutshell, is hope. Romans, the just shall live by faith. In a nutshell, the book of Romans is about faith. In Ephesians, it's about the body of Christ, ultimately the love of the body of Christ, which is love. So your faith, hope, and charity, your faith, love, and hope are foundational to Romans, Ephesians, and First Thessalonians particularly. Verse 2, it says, A good man obtaineth favor of the Lord. We're reminded later on in Proverbs 18, 22, it says that he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Ultimately, the virtuous woman is the wife that Israel should be seeking because then they'll receive the favor of the Lord and they'll go into the millennial kingdom, so to speak. A good man obtain the favor of the Lord, but a man of wicked devices would he condemn. Wicked devices, the devil's devices. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 2.11, we are not ignorant, brethren, of the devil's devices. So, and it also says a wicked man he will condemn because he's going in his own way. He's following his own path, own way, making his own choice. He's not going in accordance to the word of the Lord, the wise man that hears the word of God, does the word of God, and he's not checking himself, so he's not making sure that he's staying on the template of the path of life. In verse 3 it says, A man shall not be established by wickedness, than goodness. But the root of the righteous shall not be moved. So look at the first part. It says a man shall not be established by wickedness. So we know at the time of the Tower of Babel, which was an evil plan by man to come together as one world nation under Nimrod. And they weren't established by wickedness. God did not allow it. He confused their languages at the Tower of Babel from where it gets its name. Psalm 11.3 reminds us, if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So we've got to make sure that our foundation is firm, steadfast, solid. We need to be established. The word established, the first three letters of the word established is EST. If you arrange it into SET, set, that's what basically established means. To be set, to be firm. To, and the word established later comes on in uh, the epistles of Paul and established means to strengthen. So established is to set and established is to strengthen. And there's a couple of verses like Colossians 2.7 that says rooted, which we're going to get to in a moment, and built up in him, established in the faith, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So established, not established in the faith because they're already saved. So they're already set. They just got to make sure they don't grow up, they don't mature like the leaning tower of Pisa, but they grow up straight in the law. A man shall not be established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous shall not be moved. We touched on in the previous lesson, in verse 28 of the previous chapter, spoke about a branch, and here it's speaking about the root. And we know that Jesus Christ is the root of Jesse, and he's the true vine, John 15. And but the root of the righteous shall not be moved. In fact, we, according to Psalm 1 3, are like trees planted by rivers of living waters whose leaf does not wither. His fruit he brings forth in season, and whatever he does, he prospers. In verse 4, it says, A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh the shame is as rottenness in his bones. So the first part there, a virtuous woman. Virtuous is only mentioned three times in Scripture, twice in the book of Proverbs. Again, in Proverbs 31.10, where it says, Who can find a virtuous woman? Her price is far above rubies. Virtuous. Virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. She's like the rubies to her husband. The price. The other time it's mentioned is in the book of Ruth, chapter 3, verse 11. And Ruth was a virtuous woman when she came unto Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. And 
she humbled herself in the eyes of the Lord where she said to her mother-in-law, Naomi, where you go, I will go, where you lodge, I'll go, lodge, and your God will be called my God. She does that, and that's essentially what happens during the millennial kingdom when the Gentiles come to the Jews and say, your God will be our God, because they can see that God is with them. In fact, at that point in time, he's on the throne of David in Jerusalem, and more so, it fulfills Zechariah 8.23, where it says, And ten Gentiles will grab a garment, the garment, the hem of one Jew, and they'll say, Teach us, because you know God is with you. So, Ruth is mentioned as a virtuous woman. Then we look at, But she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness to his bones, like a Jezebel. Or, if you look at Goma in the book of Hosea, Hosea Goma was like a prostitute. She went off like a whore as a harlot to pay the harlot. And essentially what she did in the natural physical sense is what Israel did spiritually speaking. They chased after foreign and other gods, strange gods. And that's what she did. And she was a metaphor for Israel. Um, verse 5 says, The thoughts of the righteous are right. But the counsels of the wicked are deceit. So when you get to verse 5 and 6 here, there's a couple of words that all kind of string together, like thoughts, counsels, words, and mouth. We'll get to mouth in a moment. The thoughts of the righteous are right. So we've got the mind of Christ. You are reading the Word of God. You're doing the Word of God. And you're in the right situation because your counsel is from the Word of God. But the counsels of the wicked are deceit. Psalm 1, 1 says, Blessed is the man that sits not in the counsel of the ungodly, but they sit in the counsel of the ungodly, and they are with vain persons, void of understanding, which we'll pick up later. So their counsel is deceitful. Deceit, remember 2 Timothy 2, 3.13, 2 Timothy 3.13 says, And evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So, at the end time, in the last days, not only now, but in the last days to come, there's going to be more and more false prophets, false teachers, and wicked men that are going to abound. We're not going to get better and better. We're not going to revival. On the contrary, it's going to become more and more evil. And we kind of bring that together at the end. Now, third last verse, we're going to touch some more on that. In verse 6, it mentions the words. So you've got the thoughts, the counsels, the words of the wicked are to lie in wait for blood. Our penultimate verse, we actually touch on the line wait to blood. So I'll mention some more when we get there. But the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. The mouth of the upright. Upright, righteousness, doing right. The mouth. Psalm 19, 14 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. My, o God, my Redeemer, my strength. So, the words of the wicked are to lie in wait. A lie is always found out, but the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. And I'll touch more on the mouth in a moment when we get to another scripture. Don't re-echo these scriptures time and time again, because it just when you get to chapter 12, you just feel as if you've gone over this. So God's just regurgitating, regurgitating, giving a layer and another layer and another layer to his words so that the simple can understand verse 7 the wicked are overthrown and are not but the house of the righteous shall stand so we've covered this already in matthew 7 24 the wise man the foolish man i did a bible teaching on this in the very beginning of the year and i showed there that the wise man is the one that builds his house upon the rock but the house of the righteous shall stand he goes through the tribulation and he stands he comes out on the other side but the wicked are overthrown and are not. The coming flood, which was what Jesus Christ spoke about in that passage of Scripture, there's a flood that's coming and it's going to wipe out those that have built their house upon the sand. And the wicked are those that have been, they're going to be overthrown during the tribulation period. Although they've taken the mark of the beast, so they can buy and sell in the tribulation period, Albeit they're going to lose their own 
souls. Don't be known too well. What good is it if a man gains the whole world but loses his own soul? And that's what's going to happen to them. They're going to gain the world. They're going to have the mark of the beast. They're going to be able to eat. They're going to eat, be able to live a life of luxury. I'll get to the book of Ezra later. Show you two things that the Jews covered. If you give those two things to the wandering Jew, he'll go anywhere. But the wicked are overthrown. They are not. More than that in a moment because it comes up again in verse 13. A man shall be commended according to his wisdom. I'm reminded here in um, Proverbs 18.16 which says, And your gift shall go before you and bring you um, much praise. What does it say there? Uh, um, a man gift goes before him and brings him before great men. Uh, a man shall be commended according to his wisdom, but he that is of a perverse heart shall be despised. So a man's gift shall make room for him and bring him before great men, but he that is of a perverse heart, he shall be despised. We've touched on him with a perverse heart already. I touched that later on in other scripture as it comes up here from Jeremiah 17.9. But essentially they are despised and perverse. We get a couple of scriptures that go together here at the moment. So verse 9 it says, He that is despised and hath a servant is better than he that honoreth himself and lacketh bread. So in Proverbs 27, 2, it actually says that it's not good for a man to honor himself. He should rather wait for the praises of another and the praise of somebody else to honor him. Um, he that honoreth himself is not good, and he lacketh bread. So, two things with regards to lacketh bread. Firstly, the prayer from Matthew 6, the prayer for the tribulation, was to pray, give us our daily bread. So there's a natural bread that he lacks. And the reason why he lacks it, we'll get to in the next two verses. But also there's the bread, the manna from heaven. The Lord's going to give them spiritual food during the tribulation. Um, once it's the rapture of the church and the body of Christ is removed. So, going back to the very beginning of the dispensation of grace, which encompassed the body of Christ, was the, the thing that sets it off was the blindness of Israel. So, at the beginning of the body of Christ, at the beginning of the dispensation of grace, you've got the blindness of of Israel at the end of the dispensation of grace at the end of the body of Christ what we understand is that Israel starts to see though they may look through a looking glass darkly but soon they'll see face to face they start to see they start to realize and see stuff hence the latter books of the Bible, the ages to come books of the Bible, the Hebrews to Revelation will be their doctrine for the last days. That they haven't unraveled. So the, the manner, the, the one that that has taken the mark of the beast, the one that is ungodly, the one is, that is void of understanding, he hasn't got the revelation from Hebrews, which is written to the Jews, James, Peter, John, Revelation. He hasn't got that knowing that it's for him. It's sad today that many Christians believe that those books, those last nine books, are for them. But fundamentally, those last nine books of the Bible are essentially for Israel, but for the last days. Um, a righteous man regarded the life of his beast. So in order to have bread, you need to have a beast in the field that was going to plow and labor and work. So that he that slumbers and sleeps, and that is a sluggard, he's not plowing, he's not laboring. So too, spiritually speaking, you need to study the scriptures to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You need to work it. Paul was a tent maker by trade. He would rightly divide the camel hide when he made the tents. So what he was doing in the natural, 
so too he was doing in the spiritual. He was rightly abiding the word of truth, knowing what is for Israel and what is for the body of Christ, knowing what is for time past, what is for time present, and what is for time future, primarily. Knowing too, if you compare Acts 3 21 with Romans 16 26, uh, 16 25, is knowing what is spoken um, in time before and what was kept secret. So Romans 16 25 speaks about what is kept secret, and Acts 3 21 speaks about what was spoken. And you see the difference between Israel and the body of Christ. The body of Christ kept secret. I've touched more than on previous Bible studies. So the one that lacks bread is because he hasn't been plowing, he hasn't been working the field, he hasn't been working his oxen. The righteous man regards the life of his beast. He doesn't regard the life of his beast. Therefore he's become lack he's lacking. But the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. So they've got no mercies, the wicked. So during the tribulation those that look after Israel, God is going to reward them. In Matthew chapter 25, it says, When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. That is essentially the, the Gentiles looking after Israel during the tribulation. So they get rewarded because God considers them Sheep at the time when he divides the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, the sheep go into the millennial kingdom and the goats go to judgment. Hence, these people that look after them, after the Jew during the tribulation, will be blessed and the Lord will spare them from going to the judgment at that time. But the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. The, the wicked, they are going to go to the judgment. He that tilleth his land. So we had the man that he plows, he labors, he considers the life of his beast. He has a servant. And he tilleth his land, shall be satisfied with bread. So the one that tills his land shall be satisfied with bread. The one that reads his Bible, the one that studies the word, shall receive the instruction, the wisdom, the knowledge, what to do in the last days. What to do as the body of Christ leading up to the rapture? What is our hope of calling? Uh, where we should be focusing on and studying? And what books are for us? Consider what I say. Many people consider what everybody else says, but not what the bounds of Romans to Philemon. Those are what we should consider what he says there, because that is going to give us understanding for our time. The other books are going to give us understanding. Now you can take application from the other books and you can take devotion and you can take encouragement and inspiration and things like that but doctrine primarily for us are within the bounds of Paul's 13 epistles but he that followeth vain persons is void of understanding void, empty, darkness he's void of understanding, he hasn't got the word of God in him he follows vain persons, false promises, false hope, empty promises, empty hope, void, nothing. It's just, they just talk, talk, but they don't deliver. They're fools. They build their house upon the sand. It's going to be wiped out, and they're going to have nothing. They're going to have nothing physically, they're going to have nothing spiritually, because they didn't lay up for themselves treasures in heaven. Verse 12, the wicked desireth the net of evil men, but the root of the righteous yieldeth fruit. So we've done the root of the righteous already in this passage when we touch there in verse um, 3. But the root of the righteous shall not be moved. Yea, the root of the righteous shall yield fruit. So notice that the wicked, the cruel, the unrighteous, the lacketh bread, he lacks bread. But here on the contrary, you've got the righteous that yields fruit. That's essentially what I read Psalm 1 3 earlier. For we are like a tree planted by rivers of living water, whose leaf does not wither, and he brings forth his fruit in season. He heals fruit hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold, whatever it may be. He heals the fruit. 
Because God blesses the work. The root is blessed. Psalm 11, 3. If the foundations be destroyed, how shall the righteous stand? But if the foundations be blessed, so if you want to, if you want something blessed, invite God into your marriage, invite God into your friendships, invite God into your relationships, invite God into your workplace, so that He can be a firm foundation, so that the end product can be a blessing and can yield fruit, because that's ultimately what we all desire. The wicked desire the net of evil in. Birds of a feather flock together. I quoted 2 Timothy 3.13 earlier. I'll mention it again. Evil men and seducers wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. They get more and more. They desire the net of evil men. But the root of the righteous yielded fruit. Verse 13. The wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips. But the just shall come out of trouble. So, the wicked is snared. Snared. A trap. A gin trap. He's caught up in his own doing here. By the transgression of his lips. By his own speaking. We mentioned earlier, we spoke about the words. And the mouth. And the counsels. And the thoughts. So, his thoughts. The wicked. His thoughts are con evil continually. Like the days of Noah in Genesis chapter 6. But the just shall come out of trouble. What is the trouble? That's Jeremiah 37. The time of Jacob's trouble. That's the tribulation. The just shall come out of trouble. The just are going to come out of the tribulation. More than in a moment. But the just shall come out of the tribulation. And I've quoted this before. Where Peter re-echoing what Exodus 19, 5 and 6 says. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, 9, he says of Israel, for he are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar treasure, peculiar treasure, peculiar people, that you may show forth the praises of him that has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, out of the tribulation into his marvelous light, into the millennial kingdom. And they are a peculiar treasure, and that is... The parables of Matthew chapter 13 are about Israel, about God finding this pearl, this hidden treasure of great price, which is Israel. Not the body of Christ. Those that preach Matthew chapter 13 as the body of Christ before the church today are confused because the body of Christ wasn't in shape or form yet. That only happened post Paul, Acts 9. So Jesus is re-offering the kingdom to Israel. It's not the body of Christ. It's not the church. But many churches today, wherever, where I am at the moment, I've got about 20 around me, they all, every single one of them, will be telling you that is the church. Verse 14. A man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. Which reminds us of Proverbs 18.21, which says, Death and life is in the power of the tongue, and those that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. More than in a moment. And the recompense of a man's hand shall be rendered unto him. The recompense of a man's hands. During the tribulation, you're going to take the mark of the beast. You're going to get the mark on your hand. I quoted John 5.30 last week where it says there that if your hand offendeth, you cut it off. So to get into the millennial kingdom, you can't have taken the mark of the beast, according to Revelation 13. You need to cut your hand off, John uh, Matthew Matthew chapter 5.30, if I said John, I apologize. Matthew 5.30, it's in the Sermon on the Mount. Because the Sermon on the Mount is the constitution for the tribulation. It's how the Jews ought to live during the tribulation. Matthew 5, 6 and 7 is the constitution of the tribulation for Israel. That's primarily what it is. It's got nothing to do with the church of God. Hands, but the hands shall be rendered unto you, but the Lord will bless the hands that have not taken the mark of the beast, and he will bless them on the other side. Verse 15. The way. The way is mentioned here for the 23rd time of the 53 times in the book of Proverbs. The way of a fool. We did the way, the wise way, the wise man and the foolish man a couple of studies back. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes. Remember the end of the book of Judges. They did everything that was right in their own eyes. But he that hearken unto counsel is wise. Those that hearken unto counsel is wise wise. There's a scripture I want to read to you. It's in Proverbs 25 which says, counsel in the heart 
of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. So a man of understanding is able to draw out the counsel that is in the heart. Remember Jesus Christ told us early on in Proverbs, He says the out of the heart of man flow the issues of life. So a counselor, what a counselor essentially does is they try and draw out those deep waters to the surface so they can understand what the person is going through and what is troubling them, so to speak, out of the heart flow the issues of life. It's not what goes into the stomach that makes him unclean at what comes out of the heart, is what Jesus Christ told us. Verse 16, a fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covereth shame. So a fool's wrath is out in the open. You know the foolish, you know the brutish, the outspoken. And But a prudent man covereth shame. Love covers a multitude of sins. Prudent man, the definition of prudent, Psalm 90 verse 12 it's the one that applies wisdom. He's prudent. If you know it's going to rain tomorrow and you're wearing a rain jacket and an umbrella tomorrow, it's because you're prudent. You have prepared yourself. Okay? If you're a man of faith, then you go out with an umbrella. You have a ex heart of expectation. Now, faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Apply your hearts unto wisdom. Verse 17. He that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness. But a false witness is deceit. So last week we looked at a false balance, a false witness. It's deceit. He that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness. He speaks truth. We've covered on the thoughts, on the counsel, on the mouth, on the words. He brings us to the surface. And when he brings it to the surface, he's known as a man of righteousness. Verse 18. There is he that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. Again, I need to quote Proverbs 18.21, which says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So here we have, but the tongue of the wise is health. Those that love it, those that love life shall be healthy. They'll... But the tongue of the wise is health. On the contrary, those that love death, it brings them into deterioration, destitution. The beginning of that verse is yeah, there is that speak of the piercings of a sword. So you have a, a wise man that will speak to you. It says if you rebuke the wise, he will love you. The foolish don't like to be rebuked. Okay, they will they'll swear at you. They'll tell you to get lost. They don't like to be rebuked. But a wise man, when he hears the word, he appreciates it and he respects it. There is he that speaketh like the piercings of a sword. So a wise man, when he's rebuked, he actually loves you for it. So in Hebrews 4.12, when it mentions here, there is a, he that speaketh the piercings of a sword. The piercings of a sword. Hebrews 4.12 says, the word of the Lord. So when a wise man speaks the word of the Lord into your life. Remember I touched on, I think it was last week about uh, the spiritual man judges all things. Measure for measure. William Shakespeare's play taken from uh, Matthew chapter 7 verse 2. Measure for measure. Um, as, he judged, so, as you judge, so you shall be judged. But if you're judging with the word of God. then it's actually God judging, not you. So, there is he that speaketh like the piercings of a sword. The word of the Lord is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even unto the dividing and sunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and in the discern of thoughts and intents of a heart. So the wise man, his word is quick and sharp and powerful and it penetrates. And it pierces. And it's, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts asunder. And it speaks into your life. It speaks life. And gives you the words of life. So that you know how it ought to live during this time in the tribulation to Israel. So wise men are going to be sought after by those that know that these guys know the way. But there will be many 
false prophets and false teachers in abundance because they're going to evil men and seduce or wax worse and worse. So you've got to seek those that have the wisdom of God during this period of time. Verse 19, the lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. A lying tongue, lies lie always found out, just for a moment. But truth abides forever. Verse 20, deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil. This is Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil. Ephesians 4.14 4, But we henceforth no more children tossed to and fro and cast about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness who lie in wait to deceive. They want to deceive you. But to the counselors of peace is joy. The end part of verse 20. But to the counselors of peace is joy. Romans 14, 17 and 18 remind us for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And these that do these things in Christ are accepted by God and approved by man. Verse 21. There shall no evil happen to the just, but the wicked shall be filled with mischief. So, I re Iterated what I said earlier when it says, But the just shall come out of trouble. And here it regurgitates and says, There shall no evil happen to the just. They shall come out of the tribulation more than in a moment. But the wicked shall be filled with mischief. They'll be filled with mischief. They'll stumble. They'll fall. They'll grow weary. They are on the sand, the fools, the single talent. They buried it. They're going to go to the judgment seat. They're cruel. They haven't been a blessing to those that are without the mark of the beast. And they're going to see their end result. Verse 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. So there is re-echoes last week's chapter 11 verse 1. It speaks about a false balance. And then we touched here on a false witness. And yet speaking about a false lips. These are an abomination to the Lord. But they that deal truly are His delight. So that's why we touched on verse 11, verse 1 where it says a false balance is an abomination for the Lord but a, um, a just weight is His delight. So we've got to, and that the deal truly are His delight. They're a just weight. To be a just weight is wisdom, which was our previous Bible study. Verse 23 A prudent man, word prudent being used for the second time after being used in verse 16. A prudent man concealeth Knowledge. So we know from verse 16, he covereth shame, he tra covereth transgression, love covers a multitude of sins. He concealeth knowledge. But the heart of fools proclaimeth foolishness. They proclaim foolishness. They speak evil, they speak wrong, they speak false, they're a false witness, they're a false balance. They speak lies, speak hypocrisy. But a prudent man concealeth Knowledge. In fact, God Himself, Proverbs 25, 2 says that it is the glory of God to conceal a thing and the honor of kings to search out a matter. So God Himself conceals things. He hid the body of Christ and the story of the body of Christ in Him, not in the Bible. It's the unsearchable riches of Christ, the book of Ephesians tells us. So His master plan that He had with the heavenly places was hid in Him. Because it tells us there in 1 Corinthians Chapter 2, verse 7 and 8 said, Had the princes of, this, of the world of darkness known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So it was hid in God. He concealed knowledge that not even the angels knew. He concealed it and He only revealed it through the apostle to the Gentiles, Romans 11, 13, which was Paul. He only revealed it to Paul. And then Paul confirms it in Romans to Philemon, those 13 books, and in 2 Timothy 2 7, he says, Consider what I say, and the Lord gives you understanding. Because what I'm telling you is, didn't, wasn't revealed. Israel doesn't know about this. The prophets didn't speak about this. Satan doesn't know about this. 
The fallen angels know, don't know about this. The angels don't know about this. This is what I'm giving you. This is fresh manner. Romans to Philemon, consider what I say. But everybody wants to go everywhere else. They want to consider what John says. They want to go to Revelation. They want to consider what Matthew, Mark, and Luke says. They want to consider what Peter says. Because apparently he was the first apostle. According to a big denomination. But you need to look and see what Paul says. Because what was given to him was unique. Chapter 3, verse 2. Have you not heard of the dispensation of grace? Have you not heard of the dispensation? And they, later on, I think it's verse 8, it says, Do, Can you not see what is the fellowship of the mystery? Apparently today, there are people in church, in Christian churches, with Bibles, that have not heard of the dispensation of grace, because modern versions have taken the word dispensation out of the King James Bible, out of their Bible, it's still in the King James Bible, They've taken it out of it's not in their modern version, so they don't know about the dispensation. They haven't heard. And they can't see what is the fellowship of the mystery. And I've touched this on earlier Bible studies before. Verse 24. The hand of the diligence shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. So we've touched on the slothful before, the slug the slothful, the slumber, the sleep. He's going to be the tail, and the diligent will be the head. Verse 25. Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. So heaviness, there's many people out there that are carrying the world on their shoulders and they're stooping. They've got problems on the marriage front, they've got problems in the household, they've got problems on the work front, they've got problems on the finance front, they've got problems with the motor car, they've got problems everywhere and they're stooping. But sometimes all they need is a good word to make it glad. There's a book called the love languages and the good word reminds me of having the words of affection having affectionate words to somebody remember we touched on earlier we did thoughts counsels words mouth that the words of our mouth and the meditation of the heart be acceptable in your sight so here we have it so words of affection is one of the five love languages along with gifts service time and touch I think it was Mark Chapman that wrote the book on the five love languages. It's a very interesting book. So here you see it here. Just a word spoken in season at the right time to the right person can just get him from stooping to being essentially upright is what we touched earlier about the wise man being upright. Then we have the righteous is more excellent than his neighbor but the way of the wicked seduces them. So if you've got three neighbors living side by side and the man in the middle has a man on the left that is wise and on the right that is a fool it tells us here that the man in the middle will be seduced by the fool he will be seduced by the wicked more so than the wise one the righteous is more excellent than his neighbor but the way of the wicked seduces him he's seduced by the wicked one he's seduced by did God really say that he's seduced by the thief on the cross He's seduced by them. Now, when you come to Zechariah chapter 12, verses 8 and 9, it tells us that only a third come into the millennial kingdom from the tribulation. Two thirds wipe out. And I'm wondering if these two thirds wipe out. And by the way, the word way is used here for the 24th time. The way the wicked seduces them. I'm wondering if while they are going through the tribulation and they are growing weary let us not be weary in well doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not but they are growing weary they are fainting um, we should mount up with wings as eagles and run and not grow weary walk and not faint but they are going to grow weary they are going to faint they are not those that wait upon the Lord, they, they can't wait any longer. It's, it's becoming too hard, too difficult. And I'm wondering if about two-thirds actually get taken out in the tribulation. Because it's just too hard. You know, every church in the Revelation chapter 2 and 3, every church is told to overcome. And maybe they just can't overcome. Maybe it's just too hard. And they eventually succumb and take the mark of the beast. They succumb... And they are seduced by the wicked. They succumb and they are fooled by the foolish whose house is upon the sand. And they don't go into the millennial kingdom. 
or obviously there's a certain amount that get wiped out during the tribulation period because of what transpires in the, this time which is called the, the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a troublesome time. It's a tribulation. It's um, a, a very wicked place, a very wicked thing. So I wanted to tell you about Ezra. I mentioned Ezra earlier. Ezra, I picked up in my Bible study notes. In Ezra chapter 9, 2, 12, 9, 12. It actually mentions there that um, the Jew, if you read it, that particular scripture through, what you deduce from that scripture is the Jew is after wealth and is after peace. He wants prosperity and peace. If you give him prosperity and peace, he'll go anywhere in the world. He's like a wandering Jew. He'll leave his homeland, he'll leave his people, he'll leave his temple, he'll, leave everything. he'll go anywhere into the diaspora. And during the tribulation, it tells us in uh, Thessalonians, it says peace and safety and then comes sudden destruction. So I'm wondering that initially, because they get their temple, they get the, obviously they have to have the red heifer, the red heifer, which is not blemished, the high priest needs the ashes of the red heifer to sanctify himself so that they can build the third temple. Once the third temple is built, it seems as if Israel has a bit of a flurry, and it may be that at this point in time that the it may be that at this point in time that they already signed a peace pact with the Antichrist, and he's created that they can build this temple, and there's a revival. A, a Jewish revival, Israel revival, with Jews going back to the homeland, making Aliyah. What they're going back to, it's, it's like having poison in the pot. You've got the, the bees coming back to the hive, but there's poison in the hive. Because the Antichrist is going to set himself up in the hive, so to speak. And they come back there at a time of peace and prosperity, because that's what entices them to come back. Because if uh, Ezra uh, sits 9, 12, anything to go by, if you give the Jew that... You'll get his attention. The penultimate verse, which I said we would get to in verse 27, when I touched on blood earlier, they lie in wait for blood. Verse 27, the slothful man roast us not that which he took in hand, but the substance of a diligent man is precious. So this reminded me of King David and the story with Bathsheba. And King David, you know, Nathan came to him afterwards. I think that's in 2 Samuel 13. And he told Nathan a story, he told him a parable. And he told a parable about this rich merchant that came into town to come visit this man that had many ewes and many lands and much cattle. He was very wealthy. But he did not take of his lamb for the feast for this rich man that came into town. He took the lamb of this one poor guy who loved this lamb, who brought this lamb into his household and treated him as his own children. And David was wroth. He was very angry. And he said to Nathan the prophet, fourfold should be given by this man for what he has done. And Nathan said, that man is you, King David, for what you have done with Bathsheba, which essentially was a virtuous woman. And... She was precious to her husband, but David took her as his own. And that fourfold is interesting because David would essentially lose four sons. He would lose the first child of Bathsheba, the young babe, Solomon's older brother. Solomon was number two from Bathsheba. He would die after seven days. Seven is essential because on day eight they would do the circumcision. So before the child was able to be circumcised, he was died. So it's just interesting 
that he died on day seven, not on day eight or day ten or beyond. So he was not circumcised, he was not sanctified, so to speak. Um, then you've got uh, Ammon, Tamar, and Ammon, Tamar, Ammon raped Tamar, and then Absalom took Ammon out, that was number two. Then Absalom himself died, was number three, and then Abiathar, which was taken out when Solomon began his reign. So David paid back fourfold. So be careful what you wish for. It sounds like a Jeffrey Archer novel, but be careful what you wish for. Rachel said to Jacob, Give me children, lest I die. And then whilst giving birth to Benoni, and then Rachel died. Now we look at the last verse, 28, to sum it all up, this chapter 12, the way of righteousness. So we have the two ways. The way of righteousness is life. Essentially here would be eternal life. And in the pathway thereof, there is no death. There's two paths, there's two choices, and Psalm 16:11 reminds us, I will show you the path of life. In my presence is fullness of joy at my right hand of pleasures forevermore. So Matthew 7 speaks about, Matthew 7, 13 speaks about the two ways, one that seems right, the narrow gate, and the way of righteousness, the way of life, the pathway, the correct way. And I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would make a wise choice and choose the right path. In Jesus' name, Amen.